Welcome everybody. Um, my job is just to sort of get us started. Uh, what I might do is first of all um, acknowledge the, the lands of the Torrival and Jagara people uh, who traditionally refer to this land as Mianjin uh, and to acknowledge um, leaders past, present and emerging and that the sovereignty of these lands was never ceded and to thank one of the oldest living cultures or the oldest living culture in the world for their stewardship of the land and water and country. Um, it, this is a very exciting topic for us, uh, the potential for electrification of transport and electric vehicles and what that means. Um, no one uh, knows more than I think Queensland, which is our biggest state that has the most regional uh, diversity and you know people people rely on our cars to stay in touch with each other in communities. So we're very excited to firsthand uh, hear from our speakers tonight. I'm very grateful uh, for Neil Horrocks for agreeing to um, be essentially our MC tonight and keep everything going. I must say thank you to Neil's lovely wife, Annette. Um, Neil's been a wonderful colleague and friend to ECA over the many years and also in his various roles. So we're, we're very pleased that, um, that he could do that. And so I'm just going to hand over to you and we can get Beautiful. moving. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks very much, everyone. And welcome. Um, we don't do this often enough. It's so nice to be in a room with people shaking hands and saying hello, isn't it? It's wonderful to be here. So I uh, hope you enjoy tonight. We're here tonight to talk about the electrification of our homes and our transport and what the future holds for us in that space. So secondly, before we embark, I just thought I would share a little bit of the history of electricity in Queensland because it's not a widely and well-known um, part of the life of people who live in this industry. But if we think back, well, we won't think back because we don't know, but back in 1882 was the first registered demonstration of this new thing called electricity. And it occurred about two streets across from us in Queen Street, where eight electric arc lamps were demonstrated for the first time. Um, and that was really quite a big thing for Queensland. Interestingly, on the other side of the globe in New York, the Edison... Um, company were installing the first of the Edison tubes. They were installing the first electricity network in New York, um, which was quite uh, an interesting and important thing. And I'll get back to that in a moment. Move forward to the next year, 1983, and the government printing offices at the top of George Street up here became the first practical use of electricity for lighting. And it was opened and they put lighting on and it changed the way they ran the printing presses up there. And the politicians came down to see their investment. And they all said, we want that. And so they got on the telegraph or whatever they did in those days. And the next year in 1984, in 1884, the Edison uh, Light Company turned up in Brisbane to install the, the beginnings of our first network, the first Edison tubes. Uh, and they ran from the printing press down to Parliament House. Uh, and that completely changed or started our move towards electricity. It's interesting to note that in 2018, when they were digging out um, the car parks for Queen's Wharf, which you may have seen when you came into town where our new casino is going to be, they found the remnants of those um, Edison tubes, or a lot of the remnants of those Edison tubes, and the good people at Energex kindly came down and helped retrieve those remnants, and they were packaged up, uh, and they were secured, and they were sent across the world. So some of those remnants have ended up in London, New York, Sydney, Brisbane, and of course Toowoomba, as you would expect. And uh, they are a great memento of our time uh, starting in the electricity industry here. I think the people in 1884, when they were watching the roads get dug up and that network, that first network being built, could have no idea what the electricity industry was going to be like or what electricity would mean to them as part of their lives in the future and all of their children and grandchildren and other ancestors moving forward. I, I don't think anyone could have seen it. In fact, as I reflect on that, uh, with 35 years in the industry, I feel like I've actually been asleep for, for 30 of those 35 because I think in the last five years there's just been so much phenomenal change. Things are changing at a faster and faster rate. We just can't believe what's happening. You know, we have 800,000 solar, rooftop solar um, installations here in Queensland and more than half of them have happened in the last five years. And, you know, we have EVs that we now talk about regularly. We have home batteries. We have so many devices that are run on, on portable batteries that we charge 
every night, which points to the fact that we as consumers are now at the centre and we are part of the destiny of the energy future. And that's important because our views and what we do is going to be important, but it's also going to be important that we get good collaboration, strong collaboration with consumers moving forward, and we need that at a material level and we need it to be reliable. Excuse me, myself. And, of course, reliability is at times challenging um, and we create problems for ourselves when we let the consumers down and we need to think about how we don't let consumers down moving forward. And I, I look not very far back to just two weeks ago in the US during the heat waves when in Colorado 22,000 households that were members of a voluntary demand management program had their air conditioners shut off for a long period of time and they weren't expecting it. They'd signed up variously over six years and they knew when they signed up that that could happen. It was certainly, it was, there was full disclosure that was part of what went on, but it hadn't happened in six years. So when it finally happened and those air conditioners went, it was a big shock and there was no opt out and they had no cooling on the hottest day. And a couple of states over in California, we had the, inter, the uh, independent market operator saying tonight between four and nine, don't charge your electric vehicle. You know, as humans, we've got long memories and we remember these things and we know the impact that that can have in the longer term. You know, I'm not, uh, I've not been here my whole life, but I've been long enough in Queensland to remember in 2007 when Peter Beattie said uh, that no Queensland will pay more for their electricity under deregulation. And that's, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard a Queenslander say that ever since, I would be well and truly retired. You know, it's just a fact of life. So we need to really think about trust and the importance of trust and building trust as we build policy, as we build systems, as we build processes. It becomes really, really important. So we've got speakers tonight to talk about the emerging transition. I'll introduce our first speaker first. Dr Liam Byrne joins us tonight. Unfortunately, um, we were to uh, have um, David Schenke. David's been held up. Dr Liam Byrne's joined us. I've known Liam for a while. I think he first called on me about 2014 when I was in uh, Energy Queensland, Energex. But Liam's the, the, the Executive Director of Distribution for the Consumers and Innovation. He started life as a lawyer, don't hold that against him, but he transitioned very quickly into energy and de decarbonisation where he has held a range of roles with some very significant players in the industry here in Queensland. His passion is very clearly in decarbonisation and helping industry and specifically in the energy and the transport space uh, and he's taking really, really positive steps to make that happen with the roles that he's taking on. Tonight he's going to be talking to us about the net zero uh, emission vehicle strategy and a little bit about the uh, electric superhighway for EVs that we have here in Queensland. So please make him welcome, Liam. Thanks, Neil, and hopefully I can live up to that introduction. And I'm sure you will be disappointed you can't hear the sultry tones of David tonight, for those who know him, but um, I'll do my best. So I guess the, well, the, th there's a lot of things we could talk about with electric vehicles and there's a lot of lenses that we can bring to this conversation, but the, what the presentation here is really about is around the electric vehicle strategy and the integration component of electric vehicles. And, but I want to touch on the superhighway first before we sort of get into it, because I think in the opening comments we are making the comment, well, now, Queensland's a big state, there's a lot of regional areas and, you know, there's a lot of range anxiety still when people say, I've got an electric vehicle, can I drive from Cairns to Mount Isa, can I drive from Brisbane to Longreach? And what Queensland's doing is we've got, over time, we'll have 55 fast charges across the state and the last phase, I think at the moment, is 24, which are really regional focus. So the first round was really Brisbane to Cairns and doing the... the I guess the coastal highway, which if you've done, is a really nice drive. Um, and then the rest of it was sort of starting to build in with fast charges across. I will say, if anyone has any technical questions on that, I can see some EQL people in the background, I'll just point to them and they can answer whatever technical questions come up. But um, it, it's a really significant sort of enabling piece. It's not the solution to charging in Queensland. It's not the only thing that people can do, but it's a good starting step to give people confidence that they can drive from Brisbane 
to anywhere or most places in regional Queensland and have a fast charger along the way to top up and get going. So I just wanted to touch on that before we get into the, the broader presentation. I'm happy to have a conversation about that later as well if people want to. So just by way of background, so Neil mentioned, so I'm the executive director of um, consumer, basically consumer policy, innovation and distribution. And EV integration is one of the policy areas that I look after. There's a few people from my team also here today as well. And one of the things that we think about with integration is there's a technical component of integration, and then there's a human component of integration. And it's, it's really both a good opportunity but quite a challenging thing to bring those two together because you can have a technical solution that people aren't interested in or you can have a, a people solution that's just technically very difficult or very expensive to deliver on. So in Queensland, we've got a zero emissions vehicle strategy. The vision's up there, and I think everyone can see the vision. Really, it's, a, it's about taking proactive steps to really transition the vehicle fleet. And there's targets embedded in that strategy. There's an action plan that sits behind the strategy. Um, and so TMR, so Transport and Main Roads, and energy to the department I'm at, energy and public works, we're sort of lead drivers. But it's, a, it's across government, we're working with EQL, Energy Queensland and others to really try and drive this and, and accelerate. And QFleet, for example, who operate a lot of the government vehicles, they've got their own target around accelerating government fleet to EVs. And that in itself was quite an important step to take because government can sort of show what some of the opportunities and challenges are themselves by, you know, actually transitioning of quite a significant vehicle fleet already. So what were some of the drivers? There's sort of, I guess, three broad themes here, but there's social, so you know, we've got health, and you know, people talk about some of the challenges of internal combustion engine vehicles. There's opportunities for skills uplift around doing things differently. Um, there's just, EVs are just different, so there's opportunity to reskill and, and to upskill and to do things differently as well. Um, there's bills, so you know, there's a graph up there that shows there's, there's a benefit, a financial benefit, once you have an EV from running it. At the moment, part of the challenge is the upfront cost of an EV can be a barrier for a lot of people, but you know, we're sort of working on that journey and the industry, not just government, a lot of this is industry itself, vehicle manufacturers are really starting to go through this. Some supply chain challenges at the moment are making things a little bit more difficult, but you know, like, like solar 10 years ago, very expensive, the price has changed. We sort of expect there'll be a learning curve around EVs that will we'll work on that as well. And obviously there's the environmental benefit. So EVs, as long as they're sort of powered by, well, even if they are powered by the current generation mix, they're better than internal combustion engines. But over time, as the grid decarbonises, that just gets better and better from an environmental and emissions perspective. So the strategy had a number of priorities. And, and I guess the yellow there is really to, to highlight the ones that, I guess, my team and what we're focused on are really looking at. And there's sort of two parts to this. One is the infrastructure. So we talked about the superhighway. You know, people can buy EVs, but if they're worried about actually charging them or not driving them to go see their, their friends and relatives, it can actually be a real barrier to uptake. And then on, on top of that, there's sort of infrastructure that there's sort of the, the overlay of, well, do we need fast chargers, super fast chargers, that whole spectrum of different charging modes and how, how do they integrate with the network, how do they talk, how do consumers respond, and technology in this space will evolve as well. It's definitely not a, a fixed space. So when we're thinking about policy in this sense, it's we have to have the foundations right, but we have to be flexible enough to actually be responsive to change that we don't even know what that change is yet, but we have a direction of where we think it's going. And then the smart charging and the, the renewables. So the renewables is sort of a, a decarbonisation of the grid component. Um, as well as the smart charging is 
do we want dumb charges that you just plug in and they just go when you're plugged in they turn off or do we want something that's a bit more dynamic a bit smarter that can talk to the network that can talk to other systems and and processes or talk to home energy management systems or whatever that thing is but this is where I touched on before around the technology and the smart charging really needs to also talk to people and and there's a real piece of work there that I don't if someone has the answer I'd love to know it because we're still working through this and it's a I think it's a, going to be a journey not just for for us but for everyone in the industry and what this means and and what's the right balance between between these things so oh, actually I'll just come over to this one you know we talk about EVs and you think oh, it's not that many at the moment if you look at AEMO's forecast in the ESU that they've just released there's a lot of EVs coming right I think there's sort of broadly more than 11,000 in Queensland at the moment if we look at 15 years or less than 15 years away, one, you know, about 1.3 million. That's a big change. That's a lot more cars on the road. Uh, and these are the things that we have to go, well, you, know, you, you can't be struck by sort of a policy inertia or an industry inertia here. You have to actively say, think, this is coming. They might not work exactly to time. So if we look at the next one, there's a bit of a slowdown or a mismatch between the forecasts and where we are now. But it's not just EVs that this is impacting. If we think of, if you want to buy a new vehicle, the parking lots are empty. There's just not, supply chain issues are everywhere. It's not just impacting EVs, it's impacting the economy more generally. And so this is one of the things that we're, we're sort of mindful that we go, well, we don't, you can't be lulled into a sense of complacency because people aren't, you know, registering and buying EVs you know, really, really fast because there's an appetite to do this. So Powerlink and Energy Queensland, they run sort of an annual household energy survey. And I think in that survey, they said between 2019 and 2022, the number of people who are looking to buy new vehicles and, and would actually consider an EV rose from 40% to over 70%. So that's three years that's a pretty big change in sort of consumer appetite for households and what they want to do. It doesn't mean that they go and buy one, but it's actually something that's on their mind now. That wasn't the case even a couple of years ago. Now, this is a pretty snazzy diagram um, and it's got lots of information on it. So I'll just talk you through it. So the yellow balls, they're the annual energy from rooftop PV. So that's been forecast by EMO. The, so if we think about the scale of this, in say 2035-ish, there's almost 57 terawatt hours of solar. So a terawatt hours of Queensland generation and 26% of that is from rooftop solar. That's a lot of energy. If we look at the green, that's behind the meter batteries. So there's a little bit now and it's growing. And, and there's sort of some assumptions made in terms of the use of the battery that sit behind these figures. But the blue one's the interesting one. This is the EV load, just from driving. So this isn't people doing different things with EVs. They're not using it as a battery or, or being a bit more exciting. They're just driving their car like they do their car now. And, the, and this is what happens. So in sort of 15 years, you start getting really big numbers. There's a lot of energy required to support the EVs. Just got a five minute notice, so I'll, I'll take that on board. Um, what this one is, is really just what's the incremental impact of EVs? So in 2020, 35, like why are we even having this conversation? Do we need to care about it? Because you know, there's sort of a materiality factor. If it's not material, we should focus on other things that would make a bigger impact. But this is big. You know, and, we, and we're still seeing that there's, you know, if the way that EMOs assumed it, there's a significant peak load impact from EV charging. Not ideal. And I'll just take a step back. So we talked a lot about EVs, but you know, this is sort of an, a generation in solar containment on a spring day. 
The green is really the solar that's had to be constrained off because there's just not enough load, basically. And then we think about, well, what, what does that mean? And again, some of our, I guess it's not my skill set, but some, some of our analytical people have pulled and done the data crunching that sits behind this. And they've said, well, what would happen if we could shift some of this load and use up the solar that's been curtailed? And what, what it really shows is that there's a real opportunity to utilise generation that otherwise would be wasted. And that allows people to actually shift and take advantage of lower price periods during the day. But I, I get at the moment the, the traditional duck curve's not, the, not what it has been a few years ago, but, um, but what we still see the, the solar impact on pricing, we still see the solar impact on other generation. And so EVs provide an opportunity to deal with that minimum demand as well. But again, we've got that human component. People want to drive a car and they want to treat it as a car. And if they have to drive somewhere, they don't want to just sit there and charge their car because it's the right thing to do. If you have to go somewhere, you have to go. And so it's sort of balancing these types of things that's really an important step for us to think about. And this is the elephant in the room. I just want to touch on it briefly. Um, so you're probably aware Queensland is working on an energy plan. Um, there's a range of actions in there that are sort of aligned to the ZEV strategy. And you can, you can dig into the ZEV strategy. It's online. So you, you can look at that. But there's a whole heap of other things. So there's building codes adjustments. There's tariff reform to, to actually help incentivise different charging behaviour. And then there's actually helping people, you know, we came back right at the start to talk about infrastructure and, and the charging. You know, there's a lot of challenges around, well, is the net, is there network capacity, is there no capacity, does the building allow it, where can we put it, how do we get people to put it in long, where they're parking for during the day, like they're driving to a train station or, you know, whatever that thing is, or car parks, like, what, how do we start thinking about that and, and supporting people to sort of, I guess, understand what the opportunities and the challenges are and to navigate that. And that's there's some of the things that we're sort of thinking about in terms of developing the energy plan. So I think I've made it in time. One minute. I'm done. So heaps of time. Well done. Thank you, sir. That's wonderful. Thanks, Liam. Um, our next speaker is Associate Professor Wendy Miller from QUT. Wendy's a member of the School of Architecture and Built Environment over there and she's devoted much of her academic life to energy in the built environment. And importantly, her research has combined not just the technological part of that energy in the built environment, but the social science part of this, which to me is the key to success in moving forward in this space and to getting that collaboration that we talked about. Wendy's also Australia's representative on the International Energy Agency Annex 80 group focused on resilient cooling. She's a member of the Resilience Special Task Group at ERA. Uh, and she's here tonight to share her insights about an amazing living lab that QUT and their partners have created out at Castledine Village um, in the north of Brisbane. Um, the, the living lab's seeking to improve the integration of some of our new renewable energy technologies. So would you please welcome Wendy to the stage? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Neil. So I uh, regard myself as a socio-technical um, researcher, so I do more of the social and the integration rather than the technical stuff, but I get a team of technicians. So I'm not an engineer and I'm not an architect, but I work a lot with both both of those disciplines in particular to try to get holistic solutions. So Castledine Village is a, um, an urban development by Economic Development Queensland. So it's a development of um, terrace houses in particular that we're looking at. Um, and we're using this development as a living lab to quantify and qualify what works and what doesn't work. So I'll give you an overview of the village itself. So this is stuff that Economic Development Queensland have, to, have done with Energy Queensland, with Powerlink and with a number of other partners. So it's got nothing to do with QUT at all. So it's a five-star, green-star communities rating. The aim, and it follows really well from what Liam was saying, the aim of this development is to try to ensure that the terrace houses are net zero 
export solar homes. And I'll explain that in a moment. But the, the idea generally is to have a holistic approach to energy use in these homes. So the house itself, as well as its appliances, the renewable energy on the rooftops, the battery storage system and the management system of all of that considered as a whole. So they're looking at the envelope, the HVAC system, renewable, the monitoring systems, but also the demand response capabilities that come with all of that. So within that, each of the homes in this development have to have a seven star NATERS rating. So that's the energy efficiency rating of the building envelope. So it, in essence, it's a measure of how well do, or how, yeah, how well your building stops absorbing heat from the sun. So how hot does it get inside? Then to balance that off, Economic Development Queensland have determined that they think that if we put on a 3.5 kilowatt peak PV system and a 10.3 kilowatt hour battery storage system and we have a heat pump hot water system and a really good air conditioning system, that should enable a household to utilise all of their solar and not export any extra solar so they're not contributing to that to that curve, but they can shift their demands around. So that was all uh, determined before QUT came onto the scene. At the same time, there's a, a new renew, uh, renew, cooperative research centre was established uh, last year. So a cooperative research centre uh, gets funds from the federal government and industry, and they develop a program of works to do a whole range of things. So this CRC is called Race for 2030. Race meaning renewable, affordable, clean energy. So it's focusing on research to try to um, become all electric and renewable energy in a whole range of different buildings and industry by 2030. So I won't go into the details of that. QUT, for the last three years, we've been running um, two living labs in Queensland as part of, uh, from ARENA or Renewable Energy Agency funding at the Queensland Children's Hospital and in an aged care centre in Fernhill. So we used that experience <coughs> to approach EDQ about running a um, program at Castledine to try to quantify and qualify, is Castledine going to work as well as what EDQ thought it would work? So we're doing the measurements of a range of things, and I'll talk about those things in a moment. But in order to do that, we take the same approach that Liam was talking about before, in that we have to look at a whole systems, not just the technical systems, but also the people systems. So the project is managed by my colleague uh, Vaughan, sitting at the front here, and we have four sub-teams. So we have a team of people who will look at the building performance. We have a team of people who will look at what's the energy industry impact of the things that are doing. We have a team of people who will look at the behavioural science, so particularly what, what do the householders who live in these houses think. And then uh, Uni of New South Wales is looking at particularly pre-cooling. So solar pre-cooling is a means of demand response whereby can you run your air conditioner using the excess solar during the day to pre-cool your house so you don't have to cool it at the peak time of, say, 4 to 8 p.m., for example. And there's an assumption in some electricity industry that um, pre-cooling will be one of the answers to using to soaking up all this solar, but not enough research has happened to say, well, what type of house do you need in order for that to happen? Will your house actually hold the cools? And will the occupants actually want to do it? Um, so it, it, that story... Um, about what happened in the US and these people who had all these, their air cons shut off. So to answer all those things, we've posed five key research questions. So I'll go in sort of a bit of detail on the first one. So the first one is to what extent is solar pre-cooling as a demand response strategy related to what the occupants need and or to the technology or the network issues. And it's really a balance of the two and we need to understand that. And in order to understand that, each of our teams is answering a different part of the question. So the, the buildings team will look at, well, can the building actually hold its cool? Because uh, it's no sense putting your air con on from 2 to 3 p.m. if by 6 o'clock it's already too hot and you're going to need to put it on again. Um, 
what's the technical feasibility, what do the occupants need, etc. Our next question is about the actual design and construction impact. I've been trying to engage, uh, I started engaging Energex Nergon over a decade ago to try to think, to get them to consider that buildings are an equal part of the energy infrastructure in Australia. It's not just the electricity network because it's the buildings that determine whether you need your aircon on or not where your, when your peak power is. So I, was, I started trying to get the energy networks to lobby the, um, the Australian Building Codes Board for higher standards in buildings. Uh, the next question relates to what technologies enable households to participate in demand response. So is it, is it just having a PV and an inverter or do you need a home energy management system and to what extent can those things happen? So in this particular estate, um, a major air conditioning supplier will be demonstrating for the first time in the world um, an API controlled um, control of air conditioning systems, which hasn't been done anywhere before. Um, but we can't say who that supplier is just yet. Um, then we're looking at what are the non-technical factors relating to success. So often we hear about, um, well, we A, we hear the word consumer, and I would say that we should actually ditch the word consumer because now us as people not only use energy, but we're also producing energy and controlling that energy, so I prefer the word prosumer. So prosumer is a, a producer and user of energy. But it's not just the behaviour of the prosumers that we need to think about, it's also the behaviour of the building industry and what houses they design and construct, how well they design and construct them. It's the behaviour of the energy networks and what they assume we want and what tariffs they offer and all of those sorts of things. Um, and it's the behaviour of all of the appliances and what, what products you can buy at the shops, etc. So it's human behaviour across all the board, not just what's considered uh, consumers. And then the, the final question was how effective is the home energy management system that's being deployed at Castledyne in enabling both the technologies and the households and the networks to all work together so that everybody benefits. Um, that's sort of it in a nutshell. So where are we up to? The homes are still being built. So I think as of today, I think there are six terrace homes that are actually completed and people are in them. They're being built and I think the estate's over, over uh, two stages. So HVAC systems are being put in. We're doing air tightness testing in the houses as they're completed before people move in so we can see are the houses actually performing as well as what they designed to perform. Renewable energy systems are going in, the home energy management systems are going in, all the control systems, et cetera. So it's a, it's, this is really early stage and there are no results to report yet. But there are further opportunities and this is, so this project, um, like all projects, you're limited in scope by, what, by the money you can get. So what this project is not doing is that it's not a longitudinal study of the energy behaviours. We only have this set of households in this estate at the moment for two years. Um, we're not looking at tariff reform and innovation, but it would be a good thing that might come out of this research. Even though all the homes have an EV circuit, we're not actually looking at which homes have, a, have an electric vehicle and how they're using it and how that sort of all integrates. We're not looking at anything about resilience. If the power goes down, will these households continue to run? Can they island off the grid, etc.? We're not looking at disclosure and expectations for future residents. So if, if the current people move out of their house and non-sell it, do the real estate agents have to disclose you know, what the expectations are regarding how energy should be used in these houses? Um, and importantly, what lessons can be applied to existing housing estates in order to get them to electrify as well? So none of those things are covered under the current Living Lab thing, but I think are all important things that need to be covered. Um, so I have a few questions questions for you. Interestingly, today there was the, um, the energy trade show at the, at the, um, at, the, um, at the showgrounds as well. So I have a question. Can, uh, so if you go on Slido, 
Do you know what the energy rating of your house is? So every house would have a, 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 a rating um, and at the moment, so if it was built from 2016, it should be a six star rating. If it was before that, it might be a five star or four star. If it was built before 2003, it's probably a zero star. So can you put in, if you know what your rating is, put it in. If you don't know, just say don't know, because I'd be really interested in seeing. And I suspect that most people don't know what their house energy rating is. So if Energex came to you tomorrow and said, will you participate in a solar cooling, what, how can you make that decision if you don't know whether that cooling is going to work in your house or not? And, and if you don't know, and I would regard this as an informed um, audience, how do we expect the rest of Queenslanders to know? So understanding the house is a really important thing for understanding demand response in relation to air conditioners. Can we go on to the next question? Okay. So uh, rank the options below according to first what you have at home. So air conditioners in living rooms, bedrooms, heat pump, hot water, rooftop solar, battery... How many? So these are the five things that are going into the Castledine village or an electric vehicle. So we sort of want to know, first of all, do you have these things that are already at home? Are they yes, no answers? I'm not quite oh, sure. It's ranking. Sort of. Oh, ranking? Ranking what they have, what they're planning to have and what they're going to have. So what I'm interested in finding out is for this informed audience... How many of you already have EVs or plan to have EVs in the next three years? How many have air conditioners in all your rooms already or plan to have them in over the next few years? How many have solar or not? Because um, interestingly, one of the uh, presentations at the industry forum today was three scenarios regarding how many house... Um, so I think rooftop PV, it's sort of 30% um, of Queensland homes have rooftop PV. I think it was 2% uh, of homes have EVs and 1% have battery energy storage systems. In my community where I live, um, all homes have solar, 50% have EVs and 40% have battery energy storage systems. Now, we're a little bit quirky and nerdy, I, I would say, but I... I suspect that the rate of change of going to all these things is going to be much quicker than what government and the energy industry are expecting. So you can just work on that for a while and and I'm done. <laughs> yeah, so they can... Ah, yes, the last question was, are your air conditioners on a demand response program? So Energex has Peak Smart or Ergon have Peak Smart where you can control... So just a, a yes or no, or don't know. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Wendy. Um, I think it's really interesting just how many more questions are still to be answered yes. in this space, and I think um, we're going to be at it a while, but they're all valid questions to answer. So our third speaker for tonight probably needs no introduction. You've already heard from her. Lynn Gallagher is well known to all of us and Lynn's a rare commodity. She's an economist who's comfortable knowing that humans rarely match the model, it seems to live pretty happily in that space and that policy sometimes misses the pathway that humans tend to take and we've got to adjust for that. She's certainly got one of the strongest lines of sight of the challenges that we're facing as consumers in Australia here today and I think she's tireless in bringing that conversation to a whole range of debates across the country continually and, uh, and you do a great service for the industry in doing that. Thank you for uh, tonight and we'd love to uh, ask you up and hear a little bit about your thoughts on electrification of homes and transport. Great, thank you. 
So, as always, uh, I'm a little underprepared, um, but most people know that I've been preparing for this for 20 years, so uh, I haven't made notes for tonight. So, what I want to do, I guess, is pull a few things together in no particular order, um, but just some observations which go to the challenges and opportunities. So, starting with um, where Wendy left off, I live in a uh, complex in Sydney, which is the old children's hospital. There are 15 buildings ranging from 10 storeys to 15 storeys. We have shared hot water systems on gas in every building. We have no access to roofs to put on solar. Uh, we have no electric vehicles because there's a policy of no EV charging in our complex. Um, and I look out over the inner west and I'm a proud Westie. Uh, and um, there are terrace houses which they're not 60 years old, they're 200 years old. If they actually have a roof, it's under a tree canopy. So even then getting solar in is really difficult. So the challenge is I make this point not to make um, Wendy wrong or embarrass her, but we are going to have this huge divide based on our building, where we live, based on our buildings, based on our building stock. Um, and we need to navigate a future in which everyone um, can afford energy, everyone has access uh, to, to affordable energy, and the transition involves not just um, you know, wonderful places like we saw with that living lab, but also how we're all going to be part of this, this future. So the other thing that I think is really important about what Wendy's just said, and people have heard me say it in many forums, that we live in tents or buildings that are closer to the standard of tents. Um, and many of you would have, you know, put that into the Slido. And I don't think putting solar on tents is actually uh, all the solution. It may be part of the solution. But I think, again, it goes to the built environment and the complexity of this. Um, in Wendy's list, I actually have nothing. That's on Wendy's list in my house. I have no air conditioning. I have no heating. I have no hot water. Um, it's all shared, etc. cetera. So... Um, the challenges come from the boring stuff as well. You know, insulation, insulation, insulating, making sure that we're not losing heat uh, or we're not getting heat transmitted through our windows, making sure we're not losing heat or having heat transmitted through our ceilings or our floors or our walls. Um, things we know how to do, but in Australia we don't do and we don't incentivise anyone to do them. So I think that's a huge challenge. Um, because otherwise, it's a bit like treating this as in the private domain, a, you know, a private benefit, a private opportunity, a private cost, whereas, in fact, this is exactly as Wendy said proudly, she is a practitioner of socio-technical tran socio transitions, and this is what socio-technical transitions do. They challenge us all that what is and what we've inherited also needs to be transformed root and branch. It's not simply what as citizens or what opportunities we may, ha may have as individuals, but how actually we transform um, our built environment, our society, our community, and the, and the adoption and uptake of technology. So I'll come to the thing that we've been also talking about, which is EVs and, and gas is not as big an issue in Queensland, but it is in some places, so I'll talk to you about that. But, you know, EVs are coming and people know about them, but nobody really is seeing themselves in that EV future yet. I mean, those of us who are well informed, we, we've all got the AMO chart and we've all got the memo. But people haven't got the memo yet. They, you know, my daughter has a seven-seater car. I don't know that there's a seven-seater electric vehicle sort of on the horizon right now. So until these things become real to people, then we're not going to see this kind of... We're not going to really understand what the lived experience of consumers is and what their aspirations are. The reality is, of course, with any technology adoption, it's slow until it's really fast. Right? and it takes a while to take off. And there's a lot of policies that have to go, and you heard from Liam 
around um, how we need to plan for the infrastructure and the charging infrastructure. Um, and also, you know, other policies that are going to impact on EV uptake. Um, I also want to, well, actually, maybe this is the point that I'll also make at this point. And again, this illustrates the socio-technical dimension. I've often heard the technology people who are in love with the capabilities of EVs and who wouldn't be, um, you know, vehicle to home, vehicle to grid, vehicle to load, you know, vehicle to X. Um, and those people say often, I've heard them say, buy a battery and get a free car. So that's the technologist view of what an EV is. To most people, to the community, to people buying the car, a car is, or in fact an electric vehicle, is mobility. I'm pretty sure my next or my first electric vehicle will not be a car. I think my next, my first electric vehicle is going to be an electric bike. I can actually walk to the city uh, faster than I can currently catch a bus. Um, which sounds ridiculous as I only live very close, but because it's a very dense part of the world, it takes a while. I'd probably ride a push bike if Sydney didn't go up and down like this. But if I had an electric bike, I could get some, ele I could get some incidental exercise. I could actually get some fresh air. I'd get all the benefits that I get from walking, but I'd at least have somewhere to put my, you know, extra computer and bags that I take with me. So my vehicle may actually be an electric bike. So again, a lot of these things are about changes in the way we think about mobility, how we move about our cities, how we think about our health and wellbeing. So I also want to talk a little bit about gas. It's obviously not as big an issue in Queensland, but it's not a non-issue where, where there are people connected to the gas network. And as often is like in my, in, like in my home, it's a shared hot water system and those things are, are difficult to manage. And, and people who have gas, uh, until it became more and more expensive, until we started facing two high fixed charges, you know, particularly where we use gas uh, down south for heating, um, you know, see gas as equating to comfort to living, you know, in a warm environment, et cetera, et cetera, having hot water when we need it without a huge, huge drama. So, again, people, uh, certainly in Victoria and in, in ACT where I grew up, 85% of people currently use gas and have not thought about getting off gas and are absolutely horrified about the idea of getting off gas. And for 50 years we told them gas was natural. Um, so there's a huge journey to make to understand why in 2050 we will not be burning fossil fuels in our home. We will not. Uh, and I'm old enough to remember we burnt coal in our home, actually. Um, so maybe all that underlines my first point, really, which is around this is all about people and practice. So I think ventures like what Wendy's doing with Living Labs are fundamental. There's no point hypothesising about what people are going to do. You actually need people to be taking the journey to 2050 and showing us how they actually are going to make decisions, how they are going to use technology, um, what behaviours um, are going to be easy and convenient and what behaviours are going to be more difficult. There's a couple of things I just want to say which all start with P for no particular reason, but one of the things that is really coming out of the new configuration of energy ministers in Canberra with a new federal government is both the cohesion and the collaboration around that room between ministers of various political persuasions, although the that most are, are Labor, but Matt Keane is, is from the Liberal side of politics and there's a Green Minister from the ACT. But the emphasis on planning, um, the emphasis on avoiding chaos, the emphasis on order, and again, I think all of this has to, not just at the big stuff, but also in what we expect and how we plan for how people's lives are not going to be disrupted, how their transition is not going to be orderly, how their transition is not being chaotic. I mean, what happens when people now go and buy a solar system that's too small or a hot water system that's too small and it's sort of like, oh, well, sorry, you know, you're on your own, you know, this is really a consumer 
driven future, it's all consumer choice, um, the solar guy went out of business and he, the inverter's not connected properly, you know, really sorry about that. Um, and there's no ombudsman to deal with that, you'll have to sort of go to fair trading who'll say, well, it's not really defective, it just doesn't really generate much solar, does it? Um, so we've got, it's that kind of orderliness and avoiding chaos. So what's good for the meta system, for the bulk power system, should also apply to, we should be creating a promise and a commitment that what happens in people's lives is also as orderly and as planned as it can be. And then we've anticipated where things can go wrong and not left people to have to navigate this transition on their own. The other thing I would say that is also being emphasised uh, together by all energy ministers is pace. There is no doubt that we have had a lost decade. Uh, it's not just in Australia where we've had the climate wars, but you know we're all very aware of the degree of global warming and the risks that that poses, and I think Australia is only too familiar thanks to flooding and storms and bushfires of how climate change is impacting us all. So, but those things can't be traded off. Sometimes I hear climate activists and, you know, good on them, basically saying, well, it really doesn't matter what the impact is on people. We've got to save the planet, you know, the planet first, people will come second. Well, in our surveys, in our research, in our dialogue with consumers, people say we want to save the planet and we also want to look after our families. You know, it's people and the planet, not people or the planet. So I think this emphasis on pace is really important. And all our research says that people are committed to pace. 43% of people in our survey say that they expect or believe that it's desirable that the transition or most of the transition is completed by 2030. But it's up to us who actually have roles and responsibilities and accountabilities in the system to be making that um, pace possible um, for people to actually um, live their lives, run their businesses, and as I said, people and the planet, not, not substituting one for the other. Um, the last thing I want to say as well is, uh, and again, this is sort of perhaps, you know, going a little adjacent to some of the things I've just said, but we've also got businesses, industry, that in a way really hasn't got the memo either. Like many of us have seen those charts which show, oh my God, energy is really cheap during the day. Like, in fact, it's really cheap. Well, I defy anybody to find it cheap on your energy bill during the day. If you go and look at your retail offer, uh, it would be extremely rare. Uh, there's, and I almost guarantee it, extremely rare that you will be being charged a cheap rate during the day. Mostly you're going to be charged a cheap rate overnight. Well, somebody needs to get the memo that in fact with all of this solar in the middle of the day, it is cheap overnight because of baseload coal that we still have in the system. It is cheap overnight because wind actually blows overnight. But has somebody missed the, the, the story that look at all that solar that's currently being wasted and not being used? So we can actually look to a behavioural response but we actually need to line up the rewards and the incentives uh, so that people actually can go, well, this actually makes sense. And it's not just for people who have solar, who, uh, you know, if you like, have been let in on the secret that the energy that pr they produce themselves is a lot cheaper than the energy they buy from the grid. It's actually, we can all benefit from it. It's cheaper for us all in the in, during the day. So the pace at which industry, and here I'm really looking at the people who actually set the pricing that you know we all pay in our bills, um, they've really got to get with the program. Uh, you know they they are still back in a in a sort of baseload coal world, charging pricing in that way. And and so then when you're doing things like the work that Wendy's doing, I mean it's just going to create confusion, complexity, 
you know, what the hell is going on? I understand it's cheap, but why are you actually charging me shoulder rates uh, during the day? The last thing I'd say as well is, um, you know, we need to take people into our confidence as well. Just as electricity is going to be very cheap during the day, it is going to be very expensive at the time when we need it the most. We will always, you know, together as a community, we will have peaks in the evening, sometimes peaks in the morning. That will need to be supplied by storage. Uh, when the sun's going down, the wind hasn't sort of really compensated yet, and that comes at a price. So, but if the, we can have some of the shifting that Wendy's talking about, it doesn't mean everybody all the time, everything. It means some things, some of the time, some people. That actually takes the pressure off the system. It means we don't need as much storage. But again, I'd say people haven't really been taken into co into our confidence yet that this is the future, and this is and and this is how we're all going to have to have to adapt our practices and our lives, but in ways that isn't disruptive to to the things that we value. So I'll stop there, and then we can go to questions. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I think some important points here. The, the whole energy poverty or the access to some of these new resources is important. And I look to some of the stuff Liam talked about, one cent per kilometre for solar-driven cars versus 12 cents for internal combustion. And that talks to transport poverty for some people who can't afford those either. You know, we've got some big challenges. On another um, matter, I just want to welcome to the room Virginia Hickey from the board who joined us. Thank you. We recognised you earlier, but welcome. Glad you're here. Um, we, now time for questions. Now a chance for us to grill the panel from today. So if I could ask all the speakers up to the front there, that'd be great. Um, we have a number of the team with microphones who'll be roving the room. If you've got a question you'd like to ask, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you um, as quickly as we can. Thank you. And I think there's an opportunity to ask some questions through Slido as well. Um, and I might start with uh, some of the questions while we're waiting to see if any come through. So we've got a question from Michael. Can the grid cope with the projected rate of EV take-up? I'm not sure who wants to handle that. Maybe, Liam, you might be someone who's thought about that a little bit. Um, I guess the short answer is it's a journey. So um, I, I think the, the question really is not... So I guess there's two parts. One is there's going to be more load, but I guess to the points that Lynn was talking about, whether the grid, you know, the extent to which the grid needs to cope with it depends on what that load curve looks like. If it's all happening between six to eight at night and peak demand times when the grid's sort of more constrained than it otherwise would be during the rest of the day, that's going to be more of a problem than if we can spread it to where there's more available capacity like in Queensland We've had a series of minimum demand days over the last few weekends and, and they're typically when there's not much load. And so what that sort of means is, well, if we can use the load at a time that's a better for both the network or the grid more generally, then that's a good thing. Um, can the grid cope with the, with the expected load? Um, I don't know the answer, to be honest. I think everyone's on that journey. Um, I won't put the, the Energy Queensland people on the spot, but they're on that table if you want to go bail them up later. <laughs> I think we don't know enough about the driving habits of people um, because, you know, at the moment when, you're, when your combustion engine needs refuelling, you'll do that on a Saturday morning or on your way home from work or something, but there are so many more options when you have an EV um, that we don't know enough about the driving habits of people and where they will expect to charge and how much they will charge and I suspect that a lot of charging will actually happen at home and that consumers will time it to happen between 10pm and 7am and just plugged when, when they go to bed. Yeah, yeah all of the above. Um, and. Uh, so again this goes to sort of living labs and lack of data in Australia. Uh, but the data in the US is 80%, and if I think about places that are very similar to Australia, like California, 80% of all trips are 20Ks or less, 80%. So trickle charge, which is what you can do in your home, and it'll actually be, when we get the pricing right, it'll be cheaper 
to charge at home and charge at night when it's parked because you're probably driving it during the day or could be driving it during the day. So we'll see a lot of people charging at home overnight. There's something like of the next 20%, almost all of it is under 100 k's. So again, that can be sort of destination charging when you're at the sports field or the shopping centre or whatever. And again, we'll evolve charging that, you know, if the car's parked for an hour or so or a couple of hours, you know, during the day, wherever it is, you know. And then rarely, and like, you know, we do road trips, right? I mean, I love doing a long road trip the best. And maybe in Queensland it may be a bit different. So this is where we're going to need some data. Um, and also, I guess we're talking about passenger motor vehicles versus... There are cars that drive all the time, tradies cars, Uber cars, delivery cars. So um, data is going to be really important. But I guess the thing is this is where the planning and the orderliness come. Let's not guess. Let's not sort of find out through chaos. Let's actually plan, if you like, almost overbuild the options um, where charging is and where it works in the network and price it accordingly and then we'll find the mix between what's convenient and what people want to do and what the network can actually manage will actually align much better. It won't always work. I mean, I don't often buy peak petrol but on the day that I need to go visit my family on a long weekend and the price shoots through the roof, then I pay it. So, you know, we may have odd days where it's going to be difficult and then demand response with electric vehicles will play a role. So anyway, that's a bit of a long answer, so apologies for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we've got a question over here. Yeah, so this is um, sort of different from a, from a consumer-prosumer um, behavioural perspective. Um, to incentivise people to use electricity during the day instead of at those peak times, is there any evidence or anecdotal evidence as to how to do that? and how, how we can actually achieve those, that, that shift? Um, I'm, trying to think, I'm trying to think about the evidence versus the sort of hypothesis. I mean, many... So electric vehicles, which we've been talking about, obviously we're all on a journey and the idea would be uh, to try and make that as convenient and cheap as possible, you know, whether it's overnight during the day. Um, what most countries are doing is working with the um, working with the things that are easy and convenient, so hot water, right? So uh, it, it's a valuable load that can be used during the middle of the day. What I would say, and and we ask in our surveys, what is your ability on a regular basis to move your heating and cooling to the middle of the day? The answer is it's very difficult. On the hottest days when what I do might keep the power on for everybody, I'm up for it and you don't need to pay me and it's fine. Do you mean I'll adjust my settings, I'll do whatever I need to do. But regular consistent behaviour for heating and cooling, uh, it's really uh, unless we... And again, if we don't solve the building stock problem, we're never going to get there. So if we solve the building stock problem, maybe it's easier, but... In most places, they're not trying to shift heating or cooling on a on a on a significant basis. You know, five percent or ten percent uh, under stress, but not regularly. For other loads other than heating and cooling, home energy management systems can be really good for appliances. So a lot of big companies have management systems to say. Once the price of energy gets over X, we're going to turn off this this system. That type of technology is becoming available at a household level. So if you have some PVs or batteries or have the ability to be able to curtail some of... You know, I won't do my dishwasher straight after dinner. I'll do it between 10 and 11 every morning, just pre-program it. So some of that programming is available now, but we don't know enough about what types of loads in households can be curtailed, how people want to manage them, and prosumers generally don't trust the energy industry to, to respond to demand response things. They want to be able to control those things themselves. And then the energy industry wants to have trust that when an event occurs, they can curtail a certain amount of... So there's a lack of trust on both sides, that, but it's not the technology that that's lacking, it's the, the, the trust equation. 
again, I'll echo all of that. I, I guess the only other thing that we're seeing in other countries as well is often it's by convenience. So a lot of people drive somewhere during the day and then they park. And in some countries they've actually just put charges in and then people start charging because the car's there anyway and it's convenient. That's not for everyone. And I think the important thing when we think about EVs is we can't just think of consumers as sort of one big homogenous group. Everyone will use their vehicle differently. Everyone will have different needs. And I think, you know, to Lynn's point earlier, we've just got to have options available for that. I think the other point is that there's household consumers, then there's fleet consumers. And fleet consumers in particular, you, know, you look at the UK, you look at across Europe, they're much more responsive to price. They're much more able to optimise the way that they run their facilities or the distribution centres. And they're the ones that are probably going to be doing some of the more heavy lifting from a demand response because they will probably benefit from it more because they've got the scale and the ability to respond. So I think like, it's, it's hard, like we're all on this journey, but we just have to think that there's a range of options and then there's a range of consumers and the responses that they adopt and we've just got to make sure that we don't just pick a solution for one subset and then forget about everyone else. Um, hey, I've just got a couple of statements, I think. Um, one of them um, is, like, my, my wife and I work from home, so if we owned an EV, it'd be really convenient to be parked in the garage and charging all day from free, from free PV. Um, the other, um, so, so I mean, obviously we've had a bit of a transition from working in the office to a lot of people working from home, so there's probably a little bit of a solution there to take advantage of that sort of situation. Um, the other thing is with electric vehicles, not all electric vehicles are capable of being fast charged. There's a device within the vehicle that prevents them from, um, it's a device that the inverter inside the vehicle that will prevent them. So most of them have a seven kilowatt uh, inverter inside them. So, you know, the idea that we can all just jump on a fast charger and charge our car in five minutes is probably not, or, you know, in an hour or two is not, uh, We've got to think about that. The expensive, the Teslas and the expensive Teslas and, and those kind of vehicles have the ability to be fast charged pretty rapidly, but there's a restrictor in most cars, especially the price point that's going to hit Australia. So, so I think the, the charging of EVs requires, again, this understanding of behaviour because we're at the moment with a petrol car, you have to go to a service station to, to refuel. But with an EV, there are lots more options of how you charge when you charge, etc. So it's it's a mindset change. So we shouldn't be thinking that we need to put in as many fast chargers as what we have petrol stations yep. for for all the cars. Yep. It's it's a it's a different a different mindset, um, but equally challenging. Okay, thank you. We've got a couple of questions online, and if we can get a microphone over here, one of the questions that's come through. Um, calls out that available or that extra generation that occurs in the middle of the day, thanks to solar and us. Is there a role for policy in directing people to charge their cars during the day or trying to drive people? No. <laughs> from, a, from an end user's point of view, I don't want a policy telling me when I should do something when they have no idea about what my circumstances are. Um, there should be a range of options um, available and I think there's lots of things we could do about solar in the day. And one would be, for example, because I export solar in the day, um, I only have a small PV system, but we don't use much. I would like to be able to trade my PV to my neighbour who doesn't have the opportunity of have sol solar on the roof sort of thing. So there's, from a policy perspective, some peer-to-peer -peer trading um, would be a really good thing for equaling out some of the social disadvantages for people who can't have PVs um, with those who have sufficient roof to be able to um, produce more than what they need. Thanks. Um, it's a good hospital pass. Thanks, Neil. Um, I guess, from a, at least from my perspective, policy isn't necessarily about directing people to do things. What policy does is it sort of encourages people to make their own decisions and encourages people to go on a direction that we think is the right one, but people aren't necessarily penalised for not doing it. So, you know, th there's, there's a range of things that are available and will help. There's certainly, I think, a role for government in thinking about how can we take advantage or support people to take advantage of you know, the, the, the daytime impacts of solar. Um, can we come up with a magic bullet that will solve it? Probably not independently of everyone else in industry and, 
and more generally. So I think it's you know, government has a role here, but it's not the only role that we're not going to have the, the magic bullet. Um, it just reminded me of some work that was done a while ago uh, using students in a sort of live experiment and using behavioural insights and the work was called, um, you know, do people prefer being hugged, smacked, um, uh, I forgot what the other one is, hugged, shoved. smacked, shoved and what was the other one? There was four anyway. Anyway, Judged. yeah. But interestingly, what, what the... Re what that experiment showed is there were times when people are happy for mandating and the example they used was water restrictions like when it's actually uh, we're in a kind of crisis and I really don't want to be pestered constantly about my shower and reminded and have lots of advertising and nudging like just tell me what the water restrictions are tell me what the target is tell me what I can do what I can't do so there are those sort of rare circumstances in fact weirdly people voluntarily do that with electricity I mean Queensland and where I grew up in the ACT it's quite common to actually say and have people do it voluntarily to say could you please reduce your consumption today and sort of people do right now they're not mandating but do you know I mean again it's the same kind of thing when there's seen a credible threat to our community we, we're happy to be told the rest of the time, we really want some choices to allow us to navigate the complexity of our lives. And a lot of the lack of permission for things like emergency containment or to manage minimum load is you don't know what it might mean to me if you did this to my appliance right now. You don't know what it means for my family. You don't know what risk or what costs you're imposing on me so there are times when it's like let me understand what it is you want to do and let me find the way that I can some of the time contribute but not all of the time so that's the complexity of what we've got to do as policy people and 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 I guess what I'm sort of partly saying and you know without being overly negative but I, I think the the industry perhaps the sort of retail sector is sitting this one out a bit because it is sort of complex and I guess they'll sort of jump in when they figure what the mainstream answer is. But the, the, the point is, it's, it's, there's going to be a lot of diversity about what people want and what people need. Thank you. I think we've got a question from the audience. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to drive an AV and I have for the last year. I had a, a misfortune last month. I was driving a rental car in Germany and had to f uh, pull into a service station. Um, what I did notice, though, was that I could have bought hydrogen at that service station. Uh, I'm just curious to know if there's any planning in regard to the hydrogen economy in transport. I, sorry, I guess I didn't touch on it in the discussion before, but the zero, the ZEV strategy includes hydrogen as one of the zero emissions vehicles. Um, uh, and there's a lot of work, you know, if you read anything in Queensland, there's hydrogens somewhere in a lot of the conversations at the moment. So there's a lot of work around development of the hydrogen industry. Um, if you, you know, I think one of the realities for hydrogen is the OEMs are less mature than in, in bringing vehicles, whether they're heavy vehicles or light vehicles, into the market relative to the electric vehicles. So you can go in and buy electric vehicles you know, off, off the market right now. Hydrogen vehicles is harder. And, but there is work around developing that industry you know, and what's the role of government in sort of building a bit like we've been talking about with the electric vehicles, building some of that, that core foundation support to make sure that hydrogen can work as an option as well. Um, I guess th the thing is hydrogen is going to be so valuable in so many upstream uses and heavy vehicle and, you know, the hard to solve emissions problems like shipping and um, airline fuels and all that kind of stuff that that the sort of further you go down to close to the home or to the, you know, individual consumer, hydrogen is just either going to be scarce or expensive. It's just going to have a higher valued use somewhere else. So also with hydrogen replacing gas, one of the things that I often say, if you can't go and buy a Bunnings appliance for burning hydrogen in your home, then, you know, people are going to replace 
um, certainly gas with electric appliances long before hydrogen becomes economic, um, you know, and that you can go and get it from Bunnings. So, I mean, I think it's a good point and, you know, this shows when you're at the frontier of technology change. Um, but I think almost some of this, what I often say, a lot of this is going to be people driven, you know, what do they need to do now and they're going to worry less about the optionality of choices later. So I think we'll see hydrogen play a big role, um, certainly where there's hard to abate emissions in other parts of the economy before we see it in the kind of uses that you're talking about. Okay, we've got a, a few questions coming through. One of them uh, is talking about the living labs um, and really interested this one's for you, Wendy. Really interested in just how well uh, these buildings are being put together, how well they're set up with everything that they need, and asks, is it achievable that we could retrofit homes across Australia, given that there's 10 million of them and at the moment in the living labs there's a dozen, is it achievable that we could retrofit homes in Australia or what's the future for getting our homes to that level of capability? That's a really good question and one that all countries around the world are dealing with. Um, my personal opinion is one way of retrofitting homes is to address the um, tax benefits that landlords get and adopt something like uh, New Zealand, for example, that you don't get any tax benefits unless you bring your rental property up to the current building standard. Um, so, which is, is sort of one way of, of getting... It. It's certainly possible to bring most of Queensland homes up to the current standard, whether it's possible to get them beyond the seven stars or something without actually knocking them down and, and building again is a bit more difficult. But I'd like to see things like instead of paying the community service obligation uh, fee to households, that that money gets invested in improving the energy efficiency of the households and their appliances so you get... Uh, recurring benefit rather than just a financial incentive at a point in time. I'll just add one thing as well. I mean, I think Wendy's absolutely right. So different countries, I mean, it's also cultural. Um, you know, I was at an IEA conference, International Energy Agency, and the Scandinavians were horrified that you actually needed to create an incentive for anybody to do the right thing as they saw it. Like, of course you build a 10-star home. We just do it voluntarily. Uh, well, the rest of us sort of, you know, are struggling. Italy bribes people. My colleague from Italy said, oh, no, we bribe people for decades. Um, so they tie a lot of their tax incentives to things. But also the point I wanted to make really to emphasise what Wendy's just said is make it realistic. Um, I think where we've seen more progress in retrofitting existing homes is where the gap between... Um, you know, the current standard and what people can actually afford and what they can manage over time and what doesn't really fundamentally move into the very, very expensive, very difficult stuff, if you can actually make it achievable and then stop and regroup at that point. So, because it, it, it does become harder to get into heritage and, you know, all kinds of other things. So I think we need to start making this feasible for Australians and something that they understand uh, they can do. And that's something really Energy Consumers Australia is thinking about how we do that because a lot of that is, you know, even I struggle with figuring out, well, what should I do with my, you know, old brick govy that has no insulation anywhere um, my niece and nephew are living in the house and six weeks' gas bill was $750. And when they got up one morning... And they turned the gas off overnight, gas heating overnight. When they got up in the morning, uh, the water... There was a bit of water in the bottom of a fry pan and it was frozen. Um, so, you know, even if I can't figure this out, right, so uh, I, I think we need to try and make it practical and feasible. Just one very quick addition to that. I think... The sort of the the seven star or the very you know the big step change from I think you know zero to, to seven that's potentially more expensive. It's okay to also take small wins and upgrade maybe some of the appliances or upgrade some of the things that just that are easier and more implementable. Not going to get to that that I guess example, but you're a little bit closer than where you were before, and it makes a difference. 
Okay, we're almost out of time. There's a, a question from the floor. Neil, uh, David Cross. I just wanted to, I've been listening to consumer behaviour conversations, um, the importance of convenience and, and that will drive a lot of those behaviours and so on. I've also uh, read a fair bit of stuff about the hydrogen industry in Europe and what they're starting to do there, uh, which is basically a swap and go system. Um, no different from filling your barbecue up uh, when, when the canisters run out. You literally go into the service station and pull out your suitcase size canister of hydrogen and replace it with another. I think limitations in the conversation tonight about um, electric vehicles assumes that the technology won't change such that we carry a second battery in some way, shape or form and that the service stations will actually be a swap and go of car batteries as well because I've also heard tonight that 80% of the trips are under 20 kilometres uh, from home. So your second battery sits in your home, gets charged overnight probably through your main system and there's a mechanism that allows you to upload that into, into, your, into your car. We, we've done it for years in, in transistors, in all sorts of stuff, transistor radios and whatever. I think the technology and the engineering will change quite quickly such that the consumer behaviours will drive that need to the point where they, people will not be inconvenienced. They will, that will prevail, so the engineering is going to have to catch up to that. And I think just a, just a comment rather than a question to anyone, um, we should think about how that um, dual um, activity will probably change behaviour. Yeah, but that the behaviour also has to be from engineers and what their expectation of technology is. I was on the 2008 feed-in tariff committee for Queensland when they were looking at, at PVs and the prevailing comment from Energex and Ergon was that rooftop PVs will only ever apply to the nerdy 1% of households. Therefore, the policy of how will the technical implication was we'll have um, you know, a certain metering type and we'll have a certain policy type, etc., because of the industry's perception of what would happen with the technology growth. And that, that was completely underestimated and we have to I think learn from that to think that EVs, really good um, houses, home energy management systems, control systems will take us all by surprise and we have to consider the behaviour and the, the responses and the expectations of everybody not just what the end user will do. Yes, it's a... Uh it's a challenging one. I had this conversation this week about some really, really big ideas that got nowhere, like Google Glasses and Segways and the new Coke and Guinness Light. And speaking of Guinness Light, we've got some drinks outside <laughs> for everyone. So I'll use that to draw it to a close. Thank you, everyone, for participating. I just want to remind you once again that Dan the Man over there and his crazy camera would love to have a Vox Pop with you if you'd be willing to just... Give a minute of your time and share a view. It would be really great. Otherwise, thanks for taking part tonight. There's time for more questions of the people here and amongst us all, so please enjoy. Thanks for coming along. <laughs>